Okay, we are reading Amy Carmichael, Rescuer of Precious Gems by Janet and Jeff Bangi. We are on chapter 10, titled Going Native. Amy dug her heels into the side of Laddie, the horse she was riding. Her long, dark brown hair streamed behind her as Laddie galloped along the pine tree-lined trail. At first, she hadn't wanted to leave Bangalore, but now that she was out of the city, it felt good to be free. She was almost looking forward to the change of climate at Kotagiri, a hill station retreat 3,000 feet up in the Nilgiri Hills, where English people like to go to relax and get away from the monsoon rains that fell during April and May. As she galloped ahead, Amy looked back at the rest of the party she was traveling with. The group had just rounded a corner and were coming into sight, and what a sight they were. Her three fellow missionaries were being carried on sedan chairs, chairs with long poles on either side that were carried on the shoulders of eight servants. Behind the sedan chairs came Saral, carrying a light load of clothing, and then 12 other servants, all big, strong men and all laboring under the burden of, of a box or a trunk, the missionary's luggage. The servants were transporting everything from badminton rackets and nets to a matching set of folding chairs. Already on the trip up to Kotagiri, Amy had passed one family with a piano being carried on a bullock cart and another family with an iron bathtub among its vacation equipment. Amy turned her attention back to the trail ahead. The procession re behind her represented everything she didn't like about India. It took 36 servants to transport four English people and all of their unnecessary belongings from Bangalore up to the hill station of Kotagiri so the missionaries could have some rest. Don't the servants need rest a hundred more times than we do? Amy quizzed herself as she rode on. She longed to live life simply, free from morning and afternoon teas, handiwork circles and cricket matches. She wanted to be free to reach out to Indian people. She wanted to get to know them as individuals and not just servants. But how could she do this? She was an English woman surrounded by Indian servants. The English weren't supposed to treat Indians as anything other than servants. As she rode along, smelling the wonderful oils from the pine trees and listening with delight to the sounds of a thousand birds, she came up with an idea. Why not move in with an Indian family? After all, she could learn the Tamil language far more easily and get to know Indians much better if she lived among them. As she turned the idea over and over in her mind, she could see only one problem, but it was a big problem. Going native as identifying too closely with the local people, was known in the missionary community, was greatly frowned upon. A person who went native was considered to be letting down the whole mission by giving up civilized English traditions. Such action was seen as nothing less than shunning Queen Victoria and the empire. Still, Amy couldn't get the idea out of her mind, but how could she make it work? What she needed was someone who was well respected in the English missionary community who would support her in the plan. The trouble was, Amy didn't know anyone who thought living with a native was anything less than crazy. Finally, she right, arrived at Kotagiri and straight away she was in the middle of another problem. Problems seemed to follow Amy wherever she went. She just couldn't get used to being an empire lady. Her problem this time was that Kotagiri was a favored destination for the English, including missionaries, precisely because there were so few Indians there. The Indians who were there were mostly servants who kept their place and kept well out of sight whenever possible. Amy had brought Saral with her, but she treated her not as a servant, but as a friend and assistant, just like she treated Masaki-san in Japan. Amy expected to share her room with Saral during her stay in Kotagiri, but the very idea was outrageous to the other English folk. Gossip quickly spread around Kotagiri that there was a small Irish upstart in town. People wanted to know who she thought she was, upsetting the whole social order of Kotagiri so she could have an Indian friend stay with her. Finally, Amy gave in and Saral stayed with the other servants. But the experience greatly disturbed Amy. It was not easy for her to see barriers between Christians. Yet her disappointment sparked in her the desire to someday find a way to break down such barriers. 
While in Kotagiri, Amy continued to spread to spend her six hours a day studying the Tamil language, just as she'd done in Bangalore. When she wasn't studying, she would explore the surrounding hills with Saral, but as they explored, Amy began to find that walking long distances, distances made her very tired. Her body was letting her down again. Since coming to India, her health had deteriorated, and most of her co-workers told her they didn't think she'd last a year in India. Despite her weakened body, Amy was determined to build up her strength and prove them all wrong. After several days in Kotagiri, Amy and Saral traveled onto another hill station called Uta Command. The English called the place Uti. Some people who couldn't afford to stay there called it Snooty Uti. Amy couldn't wait to get to Udi, not because she needed any more pampering by servants, but because there was going to be some Keswick-style meetings held there. One of the scheduled speakers was Thomas Walker, chairman of the Church Missionary Society in India, the society that oversaw the work of the Zanana Mission, with whom Amy worked in Bangalore. Amy looked forward to hearing him speak. Everyone seemed to have something good to say about Thomas Walker. Actually, everyone referred to him as Ayer Walker. Ayer being an Indian term of respect. Ayer Walker was a veteran missionary and could speak the Tamil language better than most native Indians. He also knew more about the history of southern India than any other English person. From all she'd heard about him, Amy thought she had a pretty good idea of what to expect as she made her way to the meeting where Ayer Walker was to speak. She imagined to him to be elderly, perhaps a slightly younger version of Robert Wilson. Amy tucked her Tamil grammar book under her arm just in case Ayer Walker turned out to be a boring speaker. That way she could pass the time more usefully by studying her grammar. Amy never opened the grammar book during the service, but her eyes were certainly opened. Ayer Walker was nothing like she'd imagined. He was a young man, about 36 years of age, only seven years older than Amy. He had jet black hair with not a hint of gray, and when he spoke, there was only one word to describe his speech, a very modern word, electrifying. Amy listened to everything he said, wondering how a man so young could be so wise. As she listened, in one corner of her mind, Amy had another thought. Maybe, just maybe, Ayer Walker was the person to convince to support her plan to live with an Indian family. Everything Amy wanted to do in India seemed to fit in with what Ayer Walker was saying in his address. At the close of the meeting, Amy rushed forward to introduce herself to Ayer Walker. From his raised eyebrows, Amy could tell he'd already heard about her. It was hot and stuffy in the tent where the meeting was being held, and so Ayer Walker and his wife invited Amy to take a stroll with them in a nearby rose garden. After discussing the sermon topic for about 10 minutes, Amy got up the courage to ask Ayer Walker her question. Mr. Walker, she began, her eyes looking down at the ground. I'm trying to learn the Tamil language as quickly as I can, but I'm frustrated. I would like to learn faster. I think I could learn more if I lived in a mud hut with a Tamil family and talked to them all day in Tamil instead of English. She looked up. Ayer Walker didn't say anything. What do you think? She pressed him. You wouldn't survive there for very long, he said bluntly. I'd rather burn out in a Tamil house than rust out on a mission compound, Amy replied defensively. Oh, that's just what might happen to you, Ayer Walker said without a trace of humor in his voice or on his face. Amy couldn't believe it. She thought Ayer Walker would agree with her, but instead he made rude comments about her plan. She decided she didn't like him one bit. He had too many opinions. Things were not going at all as she had planned. Maybe somewhere deep inside, Amy realized she'd met her match. Ayer Walker was just as stubborn and opinionated as she was. And they had one thing more in common, though neither of them knew it at the time. They were both about to make major decisions that would link them together in ministry for the rest of their lives. Ayer Walker had been chairman of the Church Missionary Society in India since 1885, but he'd finally had enough. The job seemed to offer only endless paperwork and the occasional chance to speak at a conference. He knew the frustration Amy was feeling, though he didn't tell her so at the time, perhaps because he was a senior missionary who wasn't supposed to feel that, that way. Like Amy, he had come to India to live among the people, not to work in a stuffy office all day, seeing mostly white faces. 
he was ready for a change. By the end of the week, when the meetings in Uti were over, Amy had softened some in her view of Iyer Walker. He was a good, it was a good thing she had, because Iyer Walker made her an interesting offer. He could see Amy was not doing well with all the restrictions of, her, of a traditional missionary setting, so he asked her if she would like to come and live with him and his wife and learn the Tamil language from them. He would arrange everything with the Zanena Missionary Society, and if she said yes, yeah. He would arrange everything with the Zanana Missionary Society if she said yes. The longer Amy was away from Bangalore, the less she wanted to go back. So she agreed, agreed to move in with the Walkers. The day Amy moved in to the Walker home, Iyer Walker himself was moving out of his mission office. He had resigned as chairman. So the Walkers and Amy Carmichael both began new chapters of their lives on the same day. Iyer Walker had long dreamed of having a band of evangelists who would travel throughout the tour no Turunel Valley district of southern India. The Turunel Valley district was located in the center of the southern tip of India, about an equal distance inland from the Gulf of Manur, Manar to the east and the Arabian Sea to the west. It was separated from the Arabian Sea by a range of high mountains called the Western Ghats. Ayer Walker had decided it was time to make his dream there a reality, so along with Amy, the Walkers moved into a small town in the district called Panavalai. By the end of July 1897, when they were finally settled into the simple bungalow that was their new home, Amy was well on her way to mastering the difficult Tamil language. The Walkers had proved to be good teachers. During her first year living with the Walkers, Amy had come to realize that Iyer Walker was indeed just as stubborn as she was. The two of them came to an arrangement that allowed them to work together and tell each other what they were thinking without hurting each other's feelings. This was a good thing because they both had plenty to say to each other. Also, during her first year at Panavalai, something happened that Amy would remember as a warning for the rest of her life. It involved a 15-year-old girl named Papamal. Papa Mal lived in a nearby town called Palam, Palamkota, the center for Christian activity in the region. Papa Mal had heard the gospel message and had told Amy she wanted to become a Christian. Of course, this meant having to make a very difficult decision for everyone concerned. If Papa Mal became a Christian, she would have to be smuggled away from her family because there was no doubt they would try to have her killed. It also would mean considerable hardship for the missionaries. With each conversation of a high caste person, a wave of nasty persecution followed. The entire Hindu community would leave no stone unturned to make life difficult for the Christians. The people would force mission schools to close, vandalize churches, beat up missionaries, and file endless lawsuits. By helping Papa Mal, the missionaries would be hurting themselves. Still, after the Christians at Palama Alam Kota had weighed the situation. They, de they decided that if Papa Ma had the faith to defect from Hinduism, they would do whatever it took to keep her safe, regardless of the consequences. It was decided that Amy would smuggle Papa Ma away to Uti, where an Indian woman who was a Christian would look after her. It was a dangerous journey as they tried to avoid people along the way. Thankfully, they both made it safely, and Amy was thrilled to have played a part in rescuing a girl from Hinduism. She decided such acts were what missionary life in India was about. Meanwhile, in Palamkota, trouble was brewing. Once word got around that Papa Mal had left her family and broken caste, hardly anyone would speak to the missionaries. Indian parents pulled their children out of school, while other Indians declared they would rather die than visit the medical clinic run by missionaries. Farther north, in the mountains of Uti, the Bible woman, as most Indian Christian were no normally called, was faithfully watching over Papa Mal, watching a little too closely for Papa Mal's liking, and as it, as it turned out. One night, the Bible woman was sure she had seen a man loitering around behind loitering around Papa Mal's window. The next morning, she quizzed her in a very different story from the one Papa Mal had told the missionaries came tumbling out. No, she wasn't a Christian and she didn't want to become one. What she wanted was to be married to a man from another caste. Of course, her parents would never allow it. So she and her boyfriend had come up with a plan. Papa Mal would say she'd become a Christian and would escape from the house to be with the missionaries. The couple had hoped the missionaries would then smuggle her out of the area. 
So far, their plan had worked perfectly. Once Papa Mall was out of the area, her boyfriend would declare himself to be a Christian also, and then they would get married. But that part of their plan was not going to work. Not if the Bible woman had anything to say about it. She was furious that Papa Mall and her boyfriend had, for selfish reasons, endangered the lives and the work of missionaries in and around Halamkota. She sent a message to Papa Mall's father right away. Mm hmm. Telling him he could come and get his Hindu daughter. Papa Mall's father sent a return message saying he didn't want to see his daughter anymore. But the Bible woman would not give up. She marched Papa Mall all the way back down to Palamakata herself and left her sitting on her father's doorstep. Returning Papa Mall didn't end matters. However, Papa Mall's parents filed a lawsuit against the missionaries, claiming because Papa Mall was under 16 years of age that she had been seduced, that they had seduced a minor. Papa Mall herself filed another lawsuit against the missionary, claiming that she had been kidnapped by them and held against her will. The whole mess took more than a year and a lot of time in court to straighten out. Some Hindus never forgave the missionaries for their seduction and kidnapping and kept their children well out of reach of the Christians. Amy watched as the whole situation unfolded. She was amazed at how easily she and many others had been taken in by a trick. How did it happen? She asked herself over and over. As she thought about it, something inside her told her it wouldn't be the last trick that would be played on her. She decided that in the future, she had better keep her eyes open and her wits about her. <laughs>